Right, hello everybody. Um, my name is Lenka and I am very, very happy I can be here because I have to be honest, I never knew about stereoscopic community before. So uh, I'm originally from the Czech Republic and now I live in Belgium where I work as a space physicist. I work at the Royal Belgian Institute of uh, Space Aeronomy. So my normal job is a scientist, but I have a second occupation, which is a belly dancer. And I work as a teacher and a performer and I have a big hobby and it's history of belly dance. So I'm starting belly dance museum and I have it like in, in this room, you can see a little, little bit, a little part of my collection. And part of my collection is also some stereo views. And that's how actually I met uh, Keita on Instagram. Uh, where I posted some some of the stereo views and I have for you a presentation which will include some history of uh, belly dance and I would like to share with you uh, five of my stereo views. So let me present. Ah, here, okay. Uh, yes. All right. Please let me know if you can see my presentation. Uh, I don't see anybody, so. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yes, my presentation today will be about uh, those five stereo views. But before I will directly go to them, I have to make a little bit of introduction because I guess there are not that many belly dancers. Uh, in between you, you can all join, of course, you can start to learn as well. Uh, but just to to have some settings, I will start with a timeline. And let's see uh, how the dance actually looked like in the early uh, 19th century. So we know that in, uh, in the beginning of the 19th century, there were already dancers in Egypt. So I have to specify I'm talking about Egypt. I'm sorry, I hear somebody with unmute, not, not muted microphone. It's, yeah, thank you very much. So in that time period, we know that there were dancers in Egypt. They usually were in a group of performers. They were not just dancers. They were usually musicians, singers, poets. And these groups of female performers, they usually performed in high-class families, at social events like weddings, celebrations, but also in also in harems and um, I'm sorry, I still hear some uh, echo. So if uh, somebody can uh, just mute the microphone, please. So uh, these uh, women were performing in these, in these uh, high class families or harems, but also we had some performers who were performing publicly. And these dancers who were performing publicly were of course seen by the traveler. So therefore we have plenty of accounts um, by the way, all the pictures I, uh, I show in this presentations are part of my collection. And for example, the one on the left, you see it's from 1804. And you can see the dancer standing on the right side. So you see she's not covered. She is wearing some big uh, shawl around her hips and some uh, kind of coat. That's what they were performing in. So we know that the dancers existed in that time period and their life was really not easy at all because especially the public dancers, when they were performing, it was easier for them to perform for Westerners who were coming to visit or just travelers or uh, soldiers because there they could earn money. On the other hand, of course, the one who didn't like it was Egyptian government and locals because their Egyptian women were dancing in front of the Westerners. So they really, really didn't like it. And the reaction was that these performers were highly taxed. They had to pay a lot of money. And it was not based on any proper law. So usually the tax collector just approached the, the dancer and said, according to her beauty and skills, how much she has to pay. And then they usually took um, advantage of it. Another thing was the approach of Westerners to, to these dancers. I just, I'll just give you one example. 
The dancers uh, usually perform at these uh, events organized for, for the travelers or the, or the soldiers. And sometimes the Westerners wanted to see a specific dance. This dance was not traditional dance coming from Egypt. We, we still don't know from where this type of dance came from. And the dance was called the bee dance. And the dancer had to pretend that there is a little wasp or a bee getting into her clothes. And while she was dancing, she was removing the clothes. Of course, these dancers didn't like to do that. We are in Egypt and beginning of 19th century, but sometimes the Westerners just had enough money and were really pushy to, uh, to, to see this kind of dance. So, uh, and, and, and the dancers were in a very vulnerable position. So this is the beginning of 19th century. Uh, there was also one big problem and the government banished actually the dancers from Cairo and Alexandria. So they had to move away and they were still highly taxed. So, so the lives of dancers in that time period was really, really bad. Now I'm going to move to the other side of the, of the timeline to see the big contrast, which happened during the beginning of 20th century. Then if you would be in Egypt, you would see that belly dancers or these Egyptian uh, dancers would be like everywhere in movies, uh, especially in movies. I'm sure you remember, or, or you know, the American movies with uh, Fred Astaire and so, so on, with plenty of dance scenes and music in it. This existed in Egypt as well. Egypt, especially Cairo, was like Hollywood of the Arabic world. And the dancers had lead roles in the, in the movies, if they were good actresses, as, uh, of course. And they were traveling abroad. So for example, here you can see Samia Gamal. She was, um, she was dancing in the Volley of the Kings, American movie, but, but in Egypt, she was featured as well as other dancers in plenty of, plenty of movies. So suddenly you see that the, that the dance uh, is visible in the movies. You could go to cafe to see a dancer, to different cabarets, to see spectacular dance shows. Now, now the question is, how did it happen from this time period where the dancers were dancing usually publicly or at social events and suddenly we have this big boom of ballet dance being in the movies and entertainment places it doesn't mean that the dancers had easy life in the beginning of 20th century they they, they didn't but that's another another lecture you can also see that the dance costume rapidly well rapidly it changed so, and in this time period, that's actually for us dancers, it's one of the most critical and important period because a new dance style was actually born. The, the belly dance, how we call it right now, it's correctly named Rax Sharki. Belly dance is just a word we really don't like to use, but it's, uh, it's, it's used anyway. So in this time period, the new dance style, the Rak Sharki, was, for, uh, was formed. And that's the style as we know right now as the belly dance. And from this time period, I have the stereo views. I don't have any stereo views from, of course, from the period before. Um, I don't think they existed. I think they were popular in the late 19th century. But I don't have any any stereo view after 1900. So if anybody knows about any with Egyptian dancers, I'll be very happy to talk about it. So here are those five stereo views I have. I'm not aware of um, any other stereo view depicting Egyptian dancers from that time period. What is interesting is that all of these five stereo views actually show the, the changes which happened in Egypt. So here's the first stereo view from 1896. And here you can see a dancer, which well, we would call now Gazeya or in plural Gawazi. That's a dancer who was performing outside of big cities. So these were rural dancers. And as I told you before that in the beginning of 19th century, actually in 1834, the dancers from Cairo were banished away because, because of the taxes and people didn't like them. 
So they had to move usually south to Upper Egypt or to uh, the delta of, uh, of Nile. And these dancers, some of them, of course, stayed in those, um, in those area after they were again allowed to perform in Cairo, which happened around 1860s, 70s, something, something like that. So even when they could perform back in Cairo, of course, some of them stayed in uh, Upper Egypt, and we call them Gawazi. And here is the one of the first stereo views. What I find really nice about the stereo view is the smile of the dancer, because uh, on most of the even postcards I have from that time period uh, behind me, there are no smiles. Um, I think it's connected to the to the general idea, even if you look at Western. Uh, photography there are not that many smiles in that time period but this one is, is really really nice you can see also the the interesting dance costume it changed a lot here is another gawazi dancer uh, three years after here i want to point out one interesting thing so you can see uh, that she's wearing some kind of skirt uh, some kind of belt with some uh, I don't know how to say it in English. Like, usually they use ribbons. Here it looks like a little thread or, um, yeah. And important thing is the the chemise, the 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 blouse. Can you see a naked belly through here? You can't. But the Westerners usually address them in their accounts that they danced with bare bellies. And the reason is that in that time period, women were wearing, in, in Western world, they were wearing corsets and like so many layers of fabrics, uh, of fabric. But these dancers, of course, they didn't wear any corsets and they had just this one tiny layer covering their belly. So for Westerners, it was kind of naked belly. So that's one of the reasons why Westerners thought that all these dancers are dancing with naked bellies uh, and so on, but they, they had a piece of fabric covering the belly. This stereo view is actually pretty interesting because here you can see very, very um, typical settings where the dancers would perform publicly. I know that maybe you don't see in the crowd the dancer immediately, so let me uh cut it out and make it bigger for you so here you can see the dancer well you can see a man who is bent over this man i don't know if you can see my my cursor but here is the man he's bent over and this person is a buffoon so usually they were called ali kaka and they were just let's say comedians who were just doing all kind of jokes. And the dancers were usually accompanying uh, these, these buffoons. And you can see the dancers, there are actually two dancers here sitting on the back of the guy. I know you can see definitely one of them sitting with her back towards us, but there is also one more dancer. Her face we cannot see, she's just sitting in front of the, the first dancer. So this is pretty interesting stereo view because here we can see really the the, um, the celebration or we call it mawalit. It's called mawalit. These celebrations where the dancers were performing. So these are rural dancers dancing publicly out of big cities. These are very nicely documented through the stereo views. Then we have another group of dancers. These dancers, after they were allowed to dance in Cairo, again, are called awalim. And these performers, by the way, they were not just dancers, they also had to uh, be able to sing, play finger cymbals and play music instruments. They were called awalim and they usually performed um, at social events and exclusively for women, especially on weddings. This stereo view is from 1898. These might be uh, Awalim dancers. I will talk about it. Uh, I will get back to this interview in a bit. But just notice, um, I don't know if you can see, but the, the description says Arab muscle dancers. So in that time period, there were no, um, no, no proper term how to name the dancers. The, the term Raksharki came 
later, although Westerners were usually using already belly dance in, in, in French. I'm sorry for my French, although I live in Belgium, it's not good, but it's dance to ventre, like the dance of the belly. It already existed, this term. But uh, the, the real dancers from Egypt would never call themselves this way because, yeah, I can, we can have discussion later. However, the big thing what happened in Egypt in that time period, late 19th century, is that there was a new environment and the new environment were entertainment halls. They started in Cairo around 1860s, 70s. It's where the Britons started to give a bit more um, funding uh, to, to Egypt. However, the first entertainment halls were built for Europeans, so for tourists when they come to Cairo, so they have something to do. Uh, so there were these entertainment halls where you could see European dancers, European singers, European plays. And of course, there was an answer uh, by the Egyptians, and they built their own uh, entertainment places where you could see some comedy shows uh, for, for the locals, because they also wanted to go somewhere. Uh, and also including, of course, music and dance. So this is a postcard. Um, and it's from famous Eldorado Club or Eldorado Place. You can see musicians on the left with some beautiful um, uh, traditional instruments. In the back, you can see three women sitting. So these were singers. And those three women standing in front, these were the dancers. And this is critical um, for us dancers because now you have a stage. Now the dancers don't have to dance just between people publicly or at the weddings, but suddenly you have a big stage. You have to move around it. You, you have to do a bit different repertoire. There were plenty of other artists coming all, all around the well, world, well, from Europe especially and other Arabic countries. So plenty of other dance elements were absorbed in this dance style. And the Raksharki, the classical Egyptian belly dance, as we call it as well, was born. Of course, very, very slowly, but that's the important part. And with this, I have a last um, stereo view connected. And this, this is the one uh, we call the dancers from the entertainment halls, Rakisa, which also means a dancer. So it's, again, urban dancer, but not dancing at social events, but in the entertainment halls. And you can see that her costume is completely different than from the Gawazi dancers, the pub, those public dancers. You can see that the fabric is really nice and rich. Of course, um, yeah, that's connected to the fact that she was dancing in Cairo and, and in entertainment, uh, entertainment places. I said that I would uh, comment again back to uh, this one, this stereo view. Uh, here, okay, I, if somebody later on on YouTube listens to this lecture and is a dancer, I, I have to say this because I'm not 100% sure that these were Awalim dancers, those who were dancing exclusively at social events. I'm not sure. And the reason is that if you are a phot photographer in that time period, if you are in Upper Egypt, you can see the dancers dancing publicly, then you can approach them, ask if they want to be photographed. Well, if you're in Cairo, you wouldn't get to a wedding just, just like that. And especially you wouldn't be invited into the section for women. So you wouldn't see the Awalim dancers. It's much more easier to go to entertainment plays and approach the dancers there because they dance every day on the stage. So most likely these dancers I sh I'm showing uh, in this, um, stereo view were also dancing at some entertainment plays, a cafe. However, it is still transition period. So the dancers who were dancing at social events suddenly had new opportunities and some of them started to dance in the entertainment halls as well. So I'm of course not sure what was, uh, where these particular dancers were performing, but they might be both Awalim or Rakisa. It was this transition period, but definitely very, very interesting time period. Voila. So uh, these are the five uh, stereo views 
I have in my collection. And I have to say that uh, for me, I know that most of you will probably laugh because you you are used to have stereo views in your hands and in the and in the stereoscopes. But when I purchased my um, stereoscope, uh, it should be from late 19th century as well. It was a shock for me to see <laughs> to see the stereo view through the stereoscope. I didn't expect such a wonderful 3D effect. I really didn't expect it, and especially to see a part of history of a dance in 3D. I my mind was really blown away. It was amazing. So now when I have my little belly dance museum here at my house, whenever some vi visitors come over. I have to show them the stereo views through the stereoscope because that's unbelievable. Uh, yes. So uh, these are the five stereo views I wanted to share with you. And yeah, thank you so much for listening. Unfortunately, I don't see you, so I don't see any reactions right now. But please, if you have any questions, I will be very happy. You can, of course, uh, see my uh, museum uh, on my website. Uh, I'm trying to put my collection there. I have right now more than 400 items. The oldest one is from 1737, like real. Um, and uh, I'm trying to put the put, put the collection online, but now I, I have just one fourth of it online and it's free to, to visit. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alenka. That was... Um really fascinating. I didn't realize you were even going to share like all of that history. So that really, I think that really put the the stereo views into context um, for us. So really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And I, I know there are questions. Um, so I will I will let people ask. I, I have a couple of questions as well. Um, but I, I will say that I see that Ian has typed here um, in the chat that there's a, another stereo view about a muscle dancer, Ian? Yeah, another um, another Kilburn card that um, mentions a muscle dancer. I didn't realize it was a belly dancer, of course, um, but it's just a single muscle dancer and no other subjects. Uh, it was presumably, I would, I would assume, taken on the same trip. It's certainly late 19th century. Um, I have no idea where it is or if I even still have it, but I might. Uh, but so there's at least one more for you to hunt down out there. Cool. Good to know. Good to know. Gives me some work to do. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I, I need to see. Um, I would like to see how it looks because actually in that time period, uh, what happened in Europe was, and, and uh, America as well, was that there were there was the Salomania uh, after Oscar Wilde uh, wrote his um, Salome play and later uh, uh, Richard Strauss wrote the opera. There was a craziness between, uh, between dancers who were suddenly Salome dancers and they were, it was just big eclectism. They were connected elements from different dances. Even they created the dance costume where you have the bra and the belt and the skirt, which didn't exist in Egypt yet, but it was complete fantasy. And it's possible that some of the dancers called themselves muscle dancers as well. So it would be definitely interesting for me to see this stereo view. Yeah, it's, thank you. It's entirely likely that if, if Kilburn published two of them, there are 10 out there, you know, if, if we know of two of them. Like Kilburn would tend to take a number of, of stereo views of very similar subjects and release variants at different times. So mm -hmm. that's that's definitely a manuf well a, a photographer and, and company that I would look into further. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Of course. I will note it. So Alenka, I have a question for you. Um, how did you come across these stereo views? And did you did you find them one at a time or did you get them as a set? Yeah, I found them one uh, at the time, yes. And um, most of them are from eBay, mm -hmm. yeah. And then I, I usually, when I find something interesting on eBay, they usually are not, um, 
uh, named in the way a belly dancer would look for it. Mm -hmm. So I had to try different different names and go through the collections, uh, sometimes mm -hmm. manually. And but I think most of them I have seriously from eBay. I have a I have a special person in Egypt who is collecting for me items directly in Cairo, but they don't have the stereo views or, or postcards because they were uh, mostly published in the in the Western world. So they are not, it's no they don't 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 have it. I never found anything like that in Cairo. Yeah. And. Um... What has been the response? You said that in your museum, you have your stereoscope set up and um, for people to look through. And so you mentioned like for you, it was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm seeing this in 3D. What has been the response of, of others that, that they're looking through the stereoscope for the first time? Um, some of them had the same reaction immediately because they could see it, but some of them, they couldn't see it, uh, the, the, the 3D image immediately so they had to play with the distance a little bit but some really couldn't see it so some were a bit disappointed but most of them they were also extremely extremely happy to to see it at, um, yeah I, I sometimes do just to when i need to relax <laughs> just to take the telescope and look through it. it's really wonderful how how long have you had those um who, uh, I have them uh, for um, the oldest one. I I have one uh, for for just about a year because I started my collection uh, a, actually a year ago. Indeed, uh, it's still very fresh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, it's still very fresh. But I am a bit fanatic, so it's um, okay. yeah, it's very big already. Well, now I, I feel motivated to find some from more recent um, because I, I, um, I, you know, I don't normally collect stereo views, but I end up getting a lot of them with the mid-century uh, uh, viewers that I collect. And so I'm now motivated to kind of go through all my stuff to see if there are any related um, that you might find useful. So, oh, yeah, yes, I'll be happy. <laughs> Definitely. Does anyone else have any questions for, for Lenka? Trying to look through the. No, there's no no more questions. I see. Okay. Okay. Good. Great. Um, I I also I I just feel like I learned so much, but I did not realize that belly dancers don't like being referred to as belly dancers, and um, you know, just the whole the whole story around that was uh, fascinating. So. Yeah, thank you. I, I see they, there are some questions from Dave and Samuel. So if you want to unmute. Oh, yeah. Ah, Dave, have you made stereo views for your practice for future archivists to discover? Oh, that's, that's a very nice question. Well, I have to be honest, I'm really like a complete new, new, newbie, is it in English? Uh, so no, I didn't, but that's actually interesting idea. I like it to think of, for uh, about future archivists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if you know about the manner of dress in the last photo, if that she's wearing glow vest or did women their hands with henna? Um, the the last stereo view. They usually, uh, yeah. So that special one she had just a blouse. Normally they usually had this chemise and vest, but the last one just had a really rich fabric uh, blouse. Uh, some of the women used um, some kind of henna, but usually it was connected only to weddings or some celebrations, but the dancers uh, didn't use it that much. Sometimes they did some decorations on their foreheads, but uh, not that much. Yeah, if somebody wants to help me with that to create a stereo view, <laughs> like that would be great. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Okay. You can try the cha cha method where you just take a picture and move your phone. 
Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I'll, I'll try. I, I, I'm looking forward to the next lecture so I can also learn probably the technique better. Yeah. Okay, if there is another question, please let me know. No, I think it's 